And welcome back uh, to Haydock, where we're in the aftermath of the first race on day two of the Sprint Cup celebration weekend, as it did marketed, with the big race itself coming up in just over 24 hours' time, uh, Graham. It's a race which can trace its history all the way back to 1966. And there's a certain symmetry as far as this year is renewal is concerned, because yeah. the first two runnings went to be friendly. And since then, no horse has put together more than one win yeah, in this race. One or two have come close, yeah. and we'll touch on them later. But the, that's the statue of Bee Friendly. It is the statue there, of Bee Friendly, it? yes. We've surrounded it with a height and a flower bed now to stop Jack the Lads and Lasses, tipsy race goers, trying to mount the old lad uh, at the end of a long uh, Saturday on the Joker Juice. But no, he, he, he got this race going when it was still six furlongs, mm. but it was November and it was, it was around six furlongs. Yes. Here we go, look at this. Parfait News job. Yeah, look at them hurtling around the bend. And do they come stand side? Yeah, be friendly making a beeline for the stand side, oh, owned of course by the late Sir Peter O'Sullivan, who'd walked the course in the morning mm. and established that you had to be hard under the stand rail on rain softened ground. And they were the explicit instructions to the jockey, get the stands rail. One, I'm not sure what the weather was like, but it looks very murky. It was November after all. Two, look how wide that track is in those days. Now we have two tracks in it, in an outer track. But no, that was uh, Canny Old Pedro, the late, great Peter O'Sullivan, uh, had his sums worked out. And wasn't there a, a tale, apocryphal or not, that he, that he walked the track and put a, a bit of felt ten, felt pen, sharpie pencil on the rail, which was the mark where his rider had to hit on the stands rail? It may well be apocryphal, but that tale has certainly been told, yes. Uh, so that was the inaugural running of the Sprint Cup, a first success of Bee Friendly. It was a repeat those 12 months uh, later. Of course, he was denied his hat-trick big mm. by a thick, what in those days would have been a Lancashire rather than a Merseyside fog. Pea Super, yeah. uh, as they called it then and still do now. I think he cost 2,800 guineas. Uh, Peter O'Sullivan had no luck. No winners in his early days in Arizona, but he struck with a vengeance later on, of course, with this horse and with a TiVo over hurdles and on the flat. There he is, there, there is Be Friendly. Oh, there is Be Friendly remembered here at Haydock. He'll be remembered, of course, with his own race here on Saturday afternoon, which will follow hard on the heels of the feature. But that brings us to Emma Ratiana, mm. who is seeking to do a Be Friendly. Yeah. His connections will be praying it doesn't rain as hard as some forecasts suggest it might. On last year's form, of course, he can win. I don't think tomorrow's race is any deeper than last year's race. What did you make of his York run? I thought it was just OK, not as good as his Nunthorpe run last year. He was beaten full length this time around. OK, but more encouraging. Um, and in the course of going down memory lane, doing some research for this after you and I chatted in the week, I was looking at, at Nunthorpe's and King Stands um, and Platinum Jubilees and Haydock Sprint Cups. And just, it just came to my mind just how much, and it sounds silly because it's obvious in many ways, but just how much of a specialist's trip five furlongs is compared to six. And that's why the number of horses who win Group 1s over five and six these days is very small. Mm. Batash dominated over five, not that he was ever tried over six. Not too many horses managed to win more than one group one, full stop, right. over sprinting distances nowadays. Uh, Dream of Dreams did it. He's a winner of this race. The Tin Man, Tom Bull, touched on earlier on. Emiratiana is a plausible winner this weekend, but his connections will be delighted if the forecast rain does not materialise. And that might determine whether he can follow in the hoofbeats of the horse commemorated there, Be Friendly, the only multiple winner of the Sprint Cup. Well, if we wind the clock on a little to the early 1980s, we'll find a filly who did manage to do the five and six furlong double mm. because she landed what was then the William Hill Sprint Championship at York, beating Sober. It seems that we used to have more dominant sprinters in the old days. Yeah. Horses who could dominate in multiple group ones over different distances were still round the bend at this point. It, it, it seems so unusual. Uh, but there we go. Habibti was a, was a hell of a good horse. Uh, she tried. Um, she was a very good two-year-old. She was... Well, she was a classic prospect, yeah, wasn't she? And she came up short early on uh, in the season. But from there on, when she came back sprinting, she was dominant. She won the July Cup. And there's one thread that runs through Habibti's season, and it is Sober. Who's in front of her at the moment, second Who's from the left, the dark sleeves with the white armlets, getting a nice toe 
Daddy behind Nichols is on board. Habib T. Um, Habib T and Sober had fought out the finish at York at the previous month. Habib T coming out on top. The two coming miles clear of the rest on the Knavesmire. And here we go, the repeat dose over six. Stuart, if I'm not off. mistaken, Sober was runner-up in the July Cup. Um, what was the William Hill Sprint Championship, the Nunthorpe, the Haydock race, this is a pulverising performance. Timeform described it as majestic. Seven lengths, and poor old Sober saw her Bipti's backside again in Paris <laughs> for the Prix de la Baie. She did stay on at four, she won the King's Stand and then went off the boil. But in those days, Horse of the Year was decided by the votes of 26 assorted journalists, perish the thought, and um, Habibti got 23 of those votes, she was clear Horse of the Year. As we've seen so far, the early days of the Sprint Cup coming round, uh, Ben, you know why it changed the straight course, don't you? Because they built an extra furlong. Yeah, but why? Why did they build there an extra furlong? There must have been a very dramatic incident where a horse ran off the track. No. They were told it can only be a Group 1 if course. it's on a straight course. Of course, which was 88, I think. Was 86. It? 86. 86 was the first running on the straight course. 88 so by, was when it became a Group 1, I think. So by 87, when we see ah. the winner of that race, there's a different configuration to the track. Yeah, and, and a classic example of how horses can blossom if the trainers are buccaneering and enterprising and give them a chance over different distances, Stuart. And here we go, different distances it was for Ashdale, 1987. Like Habibti, he'd started off as a classic prospect. He won the... Unbeaten two-year-old, winner of the Unbeaten two-year-old, yes. Champion um, two-year-old. Progressed rapidly through the two-year-old ranks. He went to Newmarket in April. Won the Craven. He won the Craven, beating uh, Most Welcome and Don't Forget Me, mm. did he not? Before taking both on again in the 2000 guineas. He was fourth, I think, promoted a place in the English 2000 guineas. He was third, I think, in the Irish guineas. He was ninth, can you believe it, in reference points Derby, only fading in the final furlong and a half. And then Sir Michael Start started thinking, that July Cup entry we made just after the guineas, let's give it a lash. Yeah. Didn't stay a mile and a half, perhaps we'll halve the distance and see if he goes okay over six. Yeah, so he won the July Cup. Yeah. Uh, he won at York, back at five furlongs, drawing clear late on. And this is him um, in the Haydock Spring Cup, beating a good class field. It wasn't a stellar year for sprinters. No, it wasn't. That's Handsome Sailor in the Sangster colours yeah. on the right. Interval, the Judmont Silks on the left against the rail dropping away. Yeah, she was well fancied and didn't run her race. Uh, but Ajdal, you wouldn't expect him to weaken, uh, given the fact that he was so good over longer distances. And a dominant winner in the end. And we, you can't really think of many more horses who've run in a derby. Uh, and two guineas and then come back to be a champion sprinter but in 87 he was the governor yep for a mile and a half in early june to six furlongs at haydock in september right we're going on three years ah. from 87 to Speaking 1990 yeah this is the best sprinter i've ever seen stuart that's not a controversial statement um, it is an absolute mystery how Dejour in the Sheikh Hamdan Shadwell colours managed to be beaten by Jack Berry's Todd over six furlongs at Newbury. Todd was uh, really imposing in this race. Todd wasn't was it? in this race, yeah. Uh, if you want to know how good this race was, um, well, it should have thrown up two Breeders' Cup winners, Dejour and held up in last. Is it classic thoroughbreds colours? It is the white cap right at the back of the field. That's Royal Academy. No luck in running here. With Johnny Reid on board. Uh, and Dejour. Have a look at this, it's just breathtaking easy power. It, he would make good horses look super ordinary while still on the bridle. I think that horse with the white face, I think that's him. I think that's Ron's victory. Yes, it is. After yes. this, he went to Ascot and won the diadem stakes, only group three then, now the champion sprint. He won it by 10 lengths on fast ground. Royal Academy came out under El Pigger and won the Breeders' Cup mile. And this is Dejour in full flow. Temple by two lengths, Kingstand by two and a half, Nunthorpe by four. This dominant performance against the world-class horse in Royal Academy won the Abbey by two lengths and should have won an epic Breeders' Cup sprint, but for jumping a shadow at Belmont. Now, there are those who believe that Royal Academy should have beaten him yeah. in that race uh, if he'd have got out sooner. Yeah, I, I, Dejour did the damage in the third quarter of that race and I suspect he would have pulled out plenty more had he had to. 1990, Dejour devastating. We're going on two years to 1992 and a horse who had progressed sharply uh, through the sprinting ranks, mm. Sheikh al -Badu. This was a, a champion sprinter who didn't win the Haydock Sprint Cup in his uh, three-year-old season, mm. but he did at four. That's him, right of picture, the late Alex Scott's um, 
world-class sprinter. He won the Breeders' Cup sprint as a three-year-old at a big, big price under the late Pat Edry. The late is a, a key theme of uh, a lot of these uh, videos, uh, sadly. Uh, but Sheikh Albadou, he'll always have a soft spot in my heart. I interviewed Alex Scott for time form a week or so before he won that big, valuable June sprint handicap for three-year-olds at York. Yeah, it was the, the William Hill sprint in those days, wasn't it? I had it? a giant tape recorder. He told me to switch it off. I said, why? He said, this is the best horse I've ever trained. Uh, and I said, well, it's okay, this interview won't go out until until after the York race is run. He said, well, have what you want to run. <laughs> <laughs> he went on from there, July Cup, Breeders' Cup sprint, etc. And he, uh, he puts uh, it up against a high class field, a big white face, I think, is Mr. Brooks, who'd been the July Cup winner. Yeah, under and Leicester. Bit by bit, he gets firmly on top of a world class sprinter for not one but two seasons. Yeah, and just look at the distances in behind. He's stringing the field out inside the last furlong. 30 years ago. Oh no, it's, it, it, it's absolutely scary. Absolutely scary. I think, is that us coming towards the end of our first section. We've taken a short step down memory lane. We've got to come back into the present. Anyone of a similar vintage to us will probably remember most of those races better than they did what happened last week. Uh, welcome back uh, to Haydock. Uh, Graham and I are about to take another trip down memory lane with our own personal Sprint Cup memories. Well, this is a selfish one. I know, part, it, it is. It Self-indulgent Stuart it is what people, it's, many it, are saying, it, 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 we should it, it, well call Well known for it. But this, seriously, this was the, the first Sprint Cup, first of many Sprint Cups that you called from the top of the grandstand, I believe. Yes, it was. Yeah, 2000. Oh, gosh, it's a long time ago now, isn't How it? How much more edge? It's an edgy career, that. Not one for the faint-hearted. How much more edge is there when you're calling a big Group 1 than, than a run-of-the-mill race? Uh, well, in a field this size, over six oh. furlongs, which, God, it, look, it, look, look at it. It looks like a different century, yeah. doesn't it? It's frightening, just how old it looks. I forgot oh. how old I was. Points to mention, this was a deep race in unusual ways. Uh, I'm not sure Betfair was going at the time. I think it probably was. The wretched one cool cat was sent off six to four favourite uh, and finished sixth uh, for Aidan O'Brien and Coolmore. Uh, uh, Tont Rose, uh, I think how you'd sum her up was good filly for Barry Hills. Yeah. Even better when she joined Roger Charlton. Black, yellow cat, Bjorn Nielsen. So it was buried away, middle of the pack, uh, centre of right hand side. Uh, towards the right in the front rank, dark Pat jacket, Patavellian's oh, no. yeah. up there, yeah. Somnus. And this is as close as any horse has ever, exactly so. ever come to winning two or back-to-back -back, uh, Spring Cups because Somnus had won the year before on soft ground, got the better of the mighty Oasis Dream, I think. And he came, I think, within was it a nose or a short head of winning a second here. But Tont Rose, look where she's come from. Yeah, siding through the pack. What are your memories of this having called it? 18 years ago. Still. Oh, Dad, you had to remind me, didn't you? Well, first of all is, she's never going to get there. Yeah. And then, oh yes, she is going to get there, she might get there. And then, oh, it's a funny old angle at Haydock, I'm not sure as they hit the line. No idea. Bang, she gets it right Doesn't even line. look as though she's won. She beats it? a high quality horse in Somnus. Others, honourable mentions in the race, favourites. Orientor, Airwave, yep. Bahamian Pirate and Frizzante. So, you know, it was a stacked field, and I think she was a perfect three from three that season she joined. Yes, uh, I think Roger she was. Charles, and I think yes. that was over and out uh, for Taunt Rose. Had a look at her stud record. I think on record, I think she only produced one fall. So I suspect the story did not end uh, as well at stud as it did on the race card. But on that day, she was a cracker. And to go back and answer your original question about what goes through your mind when you're doing a race like that, what first goes through your mind is whatever happens in 70 seconds, it's going to be over and done with. Um, we'll have none of that nonsense tomorrow afternoon. I don't want three hitting the line like that tomorrow. Well, speaking of 70 <coughs> seconds, how about 76 or 77 <laughs> seconds, which was the case in 2006, I believe? Yes, because there was some cut in the ground, was there not? And a horse who relished cut in the ground came to the fore. Yeah. Uh, I'm a Lancastrian, as many people will know. So it was great to see uh, Eric Alston win a big Group 1 with his uh, proven mudlark reverence. It was a second because he got soft ground in the Nunthorpe that mm. year as well. Uh, but he was a hell of a progressive horse, reverence. I think he was beaten from a mark of 73 early in his career. But this was not a soft ground um, spring cup. It was a testing ground. Uh, Eric, a master with those sprints, a stack rock from way back. Ted Burrow, of course but Reverend's probably the best of the entire bunch. Uh, almost certainly, I'd have thought. Um, yeah, he'll probably be here this afternoon, Eric, won't he? He's got Fox Hill in He's got a runner, yeah. Later on. Hard under the stands rail on testing ground. Um, who have we got up there on the extreme right in the nose, man? That's Hal Mahira, isn't it? Recognise him going through the picture there. Is it him or is it Amadeus Wolf? Oh, could have been Amadeus Wolf. I think it might it? be Amadeus oh, Wolf. Yeah. Um, I think we also have in the picture here 
Keto, who will come strong and late in the oh, Dr. Michael Hill colours. Yes, He's in him. midfield at the moment. Uh, Reverence has the rail, but most importantly of all, he has a spring cup that takes 75.8 <coughs> seconds to win. Right up his alley. Is that Red Clubs? In I think second, it is Red Clubs and the Ronnie Arcoon. Who went Hilt. on to win the race the following year. It is Amadeus Wolf charging home for a place. It is Keto running on strongly. But Kevin Darley, Eric Alston, Reverence, a second group one in about the space of a month. And now we're going to move the clock on by three years to 2009 on a day which Haydock had oh. a, a much more sombre feel uh, to things because um, a tragedy had broken out uh, the night before. We got news of it first thing on the, the Saturday morning. I can vividly remember the late Tom O'Ryan coming and speaking to me in the press room before I stood pretty much here on air for what was Racing UK yeah. in those days. Yeah, I wanted to put this one in, Stuart, for several reasons. Regal Parade was a crackerjack horse, again progressing through handicaps. But in racing, we're bickering and squabbling and fighting like never before. This is a reminder that this sport is to be enjoyed and life is fragile. Tom Orion's not here anymore. Dandy Nichols isn't here anymore. And the two apprentices, Jan Wilson and Jamie Kyan, Kayak Kyan, teenagers killed in an arson incident in Moulton overnight perhaps mm. on the same day, I think it happened after midnight, and two kids with the world at their feet, they'd have been about 30-ish now, who knows mm. what they might have achieved in the saddle and out of it. So life is fragile. Trotter Nichols, Adrian Nichols was the man on board, and I, I really remember him, he was choked up when he came in. I think it may have been his first Group 1 success. Either way, on this day, Regal Parade was a very worthy Sprint Cup winner indeed. Yeah, and understandably emotional scenes both before and after the race here at Haydock uh, that afternoon. Um, what a horse he was, what a sprinter though. Regal Parade, Air Gold Cup. Yeah. All sorts of big races. He won a Group 1 uh, in France as well. Yes, I think he it did. was after this. So he came through the handicap ranks and these were very suitable conditions for him in that he got a biggish field with a strong gallop and he was up against, I won't call a eternal bridesmaid fleeting spirit. <laughs> But she found a way of going close and not quite winning a load of really big sprints, didn't she? She did. She's got the run on them at the moment. Here she comes, Fleeting Spirit. The bronze silks, three off the fence, working her way through. Where's the winner? Well, the winner's a long way back at this stage. White colours. And he's having to try and burrow his way through the field. Yeah, but Trotter Nichols, who's got a very good sprinter of his own now, T Spirit. Good luck in Paris in the Abbey with uh, T Spirit to Adrian Nichols. Comes charging, charging through. Look at Fleeting Spirit. She must have traded uber, uber short. And even at this point, it looks like she might hold on, but not a bit of it. Regal Parade comes charging along. The biggest day, I think, of his career, but the poignancy of that day wasn't lost on anyone around this winner's enclosure. No, and the runner-up Fleeting Spirit, um, track record holder. She broke the course record over five furlongs in the Temple, didn't she? Yeah, absolutely. Fleeting Spirit. Uh, it, 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 he had a bit of an anticlimactic end to his career, Regal Parade. He raced on and on and on, and he racked up an enormous losing streak before he retired as a 12-year-old at York in October 2016, and he won that race in 09 as a five-year-old. Now, we've seen already that the race can throw up some pretty tight finishes. It was the case in 2004, of course, with uh, Tauntros and Somnus and Pat Avellian in a three-way go. In 2011, we had another three-way go, a slightly controversial three-way go. I'm betting without Dejour, but I haven't seen many better winners of this race than Dream Ahead. It was slightly controversial, uh, but Dream Ahead was the winner, beating Bated Breath and who fit mm. who fit had also been second to dream ahead i think in the july cup who fit in the same season had won the stewards cup a thunderous handicap performance off the mark of 111 i think with kieran fallon uh, in the saddle uh, for mick easterby but this was a high quality field a really deep field and dream ahead he, i think he's he's eternally underrated for one reason he was born in the same year as a certain horse called frankel ah uh. Yeah, that would probably do it, to be fair. He it? dominated the middle park stinks. He, he beat Strong Suit by nine lengths in the middle park. Didn't shine when Frankel did shine on um, Dewhurst Day. Tried longer distances early on, but once he came back to six furlongs at Newmarket and here, he was a tremendous sprinter. Was it controversial? He did wobble around, which was a feature of his performances when he came off the bridle. Yeah, white face in the middle. Bated breath down the near side in the Judmont Silks. Who fit far side? Dream ahead, wandering to his left. Did he, fourth. did he cause Who fit mm. to have to change direction late on? I can't recall whether it was a steward's inquiry. If that happened nowadays, there definitely would be. Mm. Be a lengthy one. Yeah. 
but that was a very, very high quality horse, and I think he signed off, in fact, I'm pretty sure he did, over seven furlongs in the Prix de la Forêt at Longchamp. Not many horses beat Goldikova fair and square when she was right on her game. I think she was on a game that day, but she couldn't contain Dream Ahead. Now, of course, yesterday afternoon here at Haydock, we had a race commemorating uh, Gordon Lord Byron, who was successful in the Sprint Cup in 2013, and he's one you've dropped into a rundown memory lane. Yeah, you should mention that Dream Ahead, the sire of the Sprint Cup winner in <laughs> Dream of Dreams, Gordon Lord Byron, what a story, 108 runs all over the world, 16 wins. Here, he beats Slade Power, world-class sprinter, who fits in the mix again. Further back, Lethal Force, Garswood, high-quality race, I wonder whether it was draw influence because if you have a look on the far side, John Murta, and I believe this was Johnny Murta's final Group One success of his career. Was it? I, I think so. He that. won other good races after this, pattern races, but I don't think he won another Group One, and he retired at the end of 2013. But the real story here was Gordon, who I think had been second behind Society Rock 12 months earlier. Mm. But the winning trainer, Tom Hogan, on your Tom, a fantastic character, and this cheap purchase took Tom Hogan all over the world. Big win in Australia. Wherever he went, he never gave it up without a fight, and he dominates this field. How many years ago? Nine years ago? Nine years ago. Hard running a solo up the far rail with Soul Power and Hoof It and the light coming down at the middle. Drawn two, I think it helped him. Um, but we know what a good horse he was when there was any ease in the ground. A good horse, full stop. But that was probably, even allowing for the Group 1 in Australia, that was probably the apex of his career. And um, we've got one more one to Sprint go. Cup to have a look at as we run on down memory lane. It's another one of your choices. Yeah. Harry Angel. Yeah, I, I wanted to put him in because I wanted a recent one, and I think he's the best of the recent ones. OK. I think, I think he's the best of the recent ones. I think there was a bit of a... a, a a board meeting going on before and about whether he should run because of the supposedly heavy ground. I, I look at the time for that race and I don't think it was heavy ground, but there's no question Harry Angel was a really, really good horse and the decision to go for it was thoroughly rewarded in 2017. He beats Tasleet, high quality horse, good sire now. Uh, the Tin Man, we've mentioned him, Blue Point is in the mix and um, he was just way too good for all of them, Harry Angel. Yeah, he had problems with the stalls. On various occasions one day in his at career. Ascot, was it? When yeah, one day at Ascot. Royal Ascot. Yeah. Um, but he was fine in the stalls on this account. Just look at the way he's travelled through the race down the middle of the track there. Absolutely. Good horses up against him. Tassley, blue and white, striped cap. Already mentioned um, the other horses in the race. Blue Point, probably not at his best under these conditions. No. But, you know. It's that magical memory, the grey yeah, on the extreme right. Right, right of picture. And he's well in charge and well in front over a furlong gap. So it just shows, I don't think the ground was heavy, but he was clearly fully effective on a soft surface. I think he won the Duke of York Stakes early on as a four-year-old. He looked very good, mm. and then it didn't quite go his way in a light campaign after that. So I hope you've enjoyed that jog down memory lane, uh, all the way back to the mid-60s. Uh, neither of us were here then. No. Uh, but some good memories of uh, more recent winners. What's your favorite among all those 10? It doesn't have to be the best one. What's your favorite? The favorite one? One out of all those that we've just been looking at. Um, I think because of the way the the summer had inf unfolded with the sprinters, Habibti beating mm. Sober. Yeah. Um, that she, rematch. I think she got a 136 time form rating. That was a pound behind the mighty Danger. Danger. Honourable mentions for Tim Easterby's Pipalong and yeah. Somnus. Loads of others we could have squeezed in here. Well, which one was your pick of the ten? Danger. Danger. Never definitely. seen. Never seen a more uh, devastatingly effective sprinter. Control power, absolute control power, never wasted an ounce of energy. If you go back to you, it's really weird when you look at his Abbey win. The signs for what came at Belmont were there at Longshore when he's firmly in control in the last 75 yards and he's propping. He's seen something and he's just mm, yeah. doing these little little mini bunny hops. And then he went to Belmont Park and there was a shadow maybe 15 metres from the post. He jumped it and lost all chance. Uh, but, but for that, his his three-year-old season was nigh on flawless. Well, I hope you've enjoyed that uh, short step down memory lane. It perhaps gives you an idea of the task facing Emirati Anna uh, when he goes for back-to-back -back wins in the race tomorrow afternoon, seeking to be the first horse, and indeed the only horse since Be Friendly won the first two runnings of uh, the Sprint Cup.